can I just tell you that one of the best feeling, what one of the best feelings in the world is, it's introducing one of your own postdocs when they're giving a plenary talk at a conference. Um, Hannah, I'm, I'm super proud of Hannah today. Uh, and this is exhilarating for me to be introducing her. But of course, this is not about me. This is about Hannah. So let me tell you about Hannah. Hannah undertook her PhD um, graduating in 2018 in the Quantitative and Applied Quaco Research Group at the University of Melbourne. She spent her PhD time investigating uncertainty around the taxonomies of woodland birds and the implications of those uncertainties for conservation management options that depend on classifications. Very soon after that, thankfully for us, and I'm sure Tim would agree, thankfully for the future of what Sortie would become, she defected to our interdisciplinary meta research group, now known as MetaMelb at the University of Melbourne. And in addition to the multiple projects that she has worked on there, some of which she will mention in her talk, she also operates an independent consulting business for other research groups and organisations wishing to improve the reproducibility of their own workflows. I spend most of my time in awe of Hannah, of her energy, her persistent optimism, and more than anything else, her courage. There's no doubt that she has taken serious career risks to speak out about against questionable research practices in ecology. Reading her kind of commitment to self careful and self-correcting science is what salty is all about. Breed, I mean, breeding the opportunity for early career researchers to do that without the risks that Hannah has had to take is what Sorty is all about. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that Hannah's future is in any kind of jeopardy. Check out her H index. She's going to be just fine. Apparently, metascience work does have some kind of impact. So Hannah is the very model of a transparent, reliable and humble scientist. And remember that when you listen to her excellent talk now. Would you like to share your slides, Hannah? Thank you so much, Fiona. I can't even, I can't even, that was the best introduction I could have ever hoped for. Um, I'm going to tell you all a bit about meta research from both an ecological and an interdisciplinary perspective, using insights that I gained through my work as an ecologist, as well as um, my work with Fiona in the Metal Mel group, um, which is more interdisciplinary. So I'll be talking about some of my research and also some of the other fantastic research that I've come across in the literature. Starting with um, talking about replication and what it's good for. So there's sort of two waves of understanding of replication to vastly oversimplify the issue. The original one that most people think about when they're thinking about a replication study is also known as direct or exact replication. And this is repeating experiments, well, it usually is experiments, but it could be other kinds of studies with the same environment, the same population, the same interventions, the same analysis, but usually with an increased sample size to reduce the chance of sampling error affecting the results of the replication study. And it's really good because it helps detect results that are driven by sampling error, questionable research practices, mistakes, and fraud. Um, but, um, it's not really that realistic in ecology. Um, and also that's equally true in other observational sciences and also in experimental sciences to an extent, which is why there's this newer idea of replication, which is more about a good faith replication, where you can change some things that happened in the original study when you're repeating it, but you only change things that you, you think won't influence the findings. Um, as before, it can still detect results that are driven by those same things, sampling error, questionable research practices, mistakes and fraud. But it also detects results that are a result of other aspects of the study that have been changed. Um, which does dilute your ability to make inferences about how reliable that original study was. Um, the changes that you make in that study is also based on the replicator's judgment of what's a reasonable change. Obviously, you could conduct, um, consult the original authors, but this isn't always possible or feasible. Um, but as a result, it's always this type of replication is always open to criticism for not being a reasonable test of what happened in the original study. Um, that said, I still think that it's the best way to think about replication in terms of an ecological or 
any kind of observational science. So I mentioned questionable research practices a couple of times now, and I know people have mentioned them extensively throughout the conference, but I'll, um, I particularly love studying questionable research practices, so I'm going to give you a bit of a rundown on them as well. So in 2018, Fiona and I and some colleagues, including Tim and Chinichi, um, did this great study on questionable research practices where we asked researchers in ecology and evolution a number of questions that have been asked in other fields about questionable research practices. Um, and what I've got in the table here is the rates at which, sorry, the percentage of people who said that they'd engaged in these practices at least once. There's a whole lot of practices here. I'm going to focus on the ones I've highlighted in orange, which um, we know as cherry picking. Some people roll these into the description of p-hacking as well. Basically, they're selective reporting things. Um, but I'll come back to those in a moment. The other things on this list are parking, which is coming up with your hypothesis after you've seen your results and then pretending like you'd had that hypothesis from the start when you write your study up. And there's things that are more traditionally p-hacking, which are things like rounding your p-values down to 0.05, um, excluding data after you've had a look at whether your analysis come out as uh, significant or not, peeking at your data and choosing to stop your data collection early because of hitting a statistical significance threshold, or changing your analysis to try and get across the edge of um, finding something statistically significant or otherwise noteworthy. Um, and then there's hiding methodological problems. So all in all, these practices is all, all things that are making your results look cooler and more significant, more interesting, more novel than is warranted. Um, and it provides a misleading literature. A little bit more on cherry picking, which is selectively reporting aspects of the study that showed statistically significant or otherwise noteworthy results. So basically, this is just writing up your study, only presenting the cool bits that um, you think other people will be interested in. And it's questionable because it increases the false positive rate in the literature. So that means that increases the chances that you're reporting something that you think is true, but isn't actually representative of the underlying processes and wouldn't hold true if somebody conducted the same study again. It also makes your research look more certain than warranted. Uh, on the left here, we've got a study that I've uh, borrowed from XKCD, which I think is fantastic. I said study again. I actually obviously meant cartoon. Um, <laughs> uh, showing a, a context where somebody's studying the effect of eating jelly beans on acne, and they find that if they test all of the different colours of jelly beans in order, um, one comes out as statistically significant and that's worth writing up, um, which is just a, a very fun example of cherry picking in my opinion. The thing about cherry picking in ecology is that I think that the uh, numbers on the previous slide that showed that 40 to 60% of ecologists have cherry picked at least once in their career is a pretty big underestimate. And I don't mean this in a particularly critical way, I just, and possibly I'm unduly influenced by my own experiences. But the reason I think this is because I think many of us collect data that looks a bit like this. This is some of the data I collected during my masters when I was looking at birds um, and how they relate to the structure of the vegetation. And this is just my vegetation data collection sheet. And you can see that I've rather messily collected um, 30 variables at each site um, that are collected on this sheet. There was also 112 bird species, and I could choose to zoom in on whichever of those species I think was most warranted for whatever reason. Um, there's also transformations of all of the different variables I used and any environmental variables I might choose to include that I might have found online. So there's just so much room for flexibility in this system that it's hard to imagine that I wouldn't be influenced by uh, the idea of presenting the results that are telling a better story, unless I'd been very careful about what I'd originally planned to do in the study, which is not typically, in my experience, part of the ecological research process. So 
Um, Replication studies are one way to find when QRPs might have caused unreliable results. But um, are they very common? My instinct says no. I suspect you feel the same, but I've got some results here from ecology and other fields that draw a little bit of light on that. So in the middle column here, we've got the number of studies replicated, and this is not a comprehensive um, table, there'll be some studies I've missed out or not selected. These are just exact replications. And you can see that the number of replication studies that I've found um, varies substantially between disciplines. And um, with ecology down the bottom here at three. So the difference here between that ecology number of three and the rest of the studies is the other studies were um, large scale replication projects where they selected um, some original studies and then chose to replicate them and checked how they turned out. The study, the ecological study at the bottom by Clint Kelly is, uh, is a bit different because it looked at studies that identify themselves as replication studies in the literature and how often they found um, results that were consistent with those in the original study. So it's a little bit of a different category. Also, there was only three studies that met the criteria for that in Clint's study. So maybe um, there's more work to be done there. The other thing that horrifies me about this, um, this particular table is the percentage of studies that come out as similar results when you replicate them, which in preclinical medicine turned out to be 22%, uh, which is very worrying. Experimental philosophy is the top of the table with 78% which in my opinion is something to do with how um, plausible their uh, hypotheses were to start with. I think reading some of those studies, they were foregone conclusions. So perhaps not so surprising that they replicated. Um, thinking more about how often studies are replicated in ecology. So Clint Kelly's study that I mentioned before, looked at how many studies in the literature identify themselves as replication studies, I should say, in the ecology and evolution literature do. And he did a really huge web-based scan of this and found that 0.023% of studies turned out to be, to identify themselves as replication studies, which is why he only ended up with three studies that met the criteria for checking whether they successfully replicated. Uh, in other fields, the rate is 0.01 to 1.2%, which is a little bit higher um, in the scheme of very, very small numbers. Uh, another study by Clint Kelly, which is going to be a bit of a theme here, is uh, was in 2006, and he looked at how many studies other people might rep, uh, recognise as replications. So if they don't identify themselves as replications, they might still be. And you can see that he looked at articles from three different journals here, and he found none of them that met the criteria for direct or exact replication. And then more studies that were conceptual replications, and I'll tell you a little bit more about conceptual replications in a minute, but basically they're ones where you change a few things. It's sort of in line with a good faith replication that I mentioned before. And then there's quasi replications where you do a similar study in a different study system or species. And you can see that as you get less similar to the original study than the number of uh, the percentage of studies that came out as those types of replication studies increased. And in that study, I believe that um, Clint actually identified all of the studies he found as one of these types of replications, um, which suggests that perhaps the rates of replication are a little higher than this 0.023% that came out um, of studies that identify themselves as replications. So what does replication look like in ecology? Um, I've drawn out a, up a table here to try and give you an indicative feeling of what's going on. So in the top row of this column, there's this idea of direct replication or this uh, the original definition of replication that were people were using where everything is kept exactly the same not very realistic in ecology um, where it's going to be hard to keep all of these things the same, particularly environmental conditions. Um, 
But the idea here is that by changing some of these things, and I've listed just four elements of the study here, but you could change infinite different aspects. So location, environmental conditions, study system, variables. Depending on which of these you vary, you find out different things about the original study. The idea is that if you um, tweak these things within the scope of the original study, you're still saying within, within this idea of a good faith replication that I described before. So for example, if I changed the location of a, uh, if I change the location, so if, if for example, I was reading an article that was, um, that said that its results were specific to Victorian woodland environments, I could then theoretically conduct a replication of that study in the southeast Victorian woodlands and see how the results turned out. And if my results were different, they might be driven by sampling error, QRPs, mistakes and fraud, or it might be driven by the fact that the exact location within the study scope that I chose had some particular characteristics that made the results different than in the original study. And that holds through without, uh, throughout this table. As you change more things, there are more things that might um, have influenced any differences you might find in that study. So the important thing here is that changing things within the scope of the study is uh, considered a replication test or a test of how reliable the findings were within the scope of what the original study claimed. You can do almost exactly the same study, um, but change things without, outside the scope of the original study or outside what the original study claimed. And that is a completely different kind of inference. It's more about how generalizable that result is outside their original context. The tricky thing here is that the scope of the original study is not always very well defined. Um, for example, in that original study, I might end up doing a very similar study um, and by locating it in, you know, South New, New South Wales woodlands rather than Victorian woodlands, I might be then extending something without uh, outside the scope of the original study because it was specified specifically within Victoria woodlands. But I might expect that to show a different result. So there's a lot of gray, uh, a, a similar result, I should say, because the environmental context is pretty similar. So there's a bit of gray area about what constitutes within versus outside scope, um, which is the difficulty of these good faith replications where you're making a judgment call about what qualifies a test of how reliable that original study, uh, the results of the original study was. So here, when we're looking outside the scope of the original study, we're talking about how generalizable the findings are rather than a, testing how reliable the original study was. Looking at what percentage of studies people believe are replicated, um, ecologists, so we did a study on this a couple of years ago and um, asked ecologists a, a variety of questions about how they feel about replication studies in ecology and what their role might be. And one of the questions we asked was what percentage of studies you believe are replicated? Um, and we come up with a median estimate of 10%. The mean is 22% because some people were um, outliers in the upper range here, um, which is substantially more than the 0.023% that Clint's 2019 article found, but also much lower than the rate um, of more broader replication studies that he documented in 2006. <clears throat> All right. Um, asked the same, when asked the same, sorry, when we asked the same ecologist uh, whether there should be more replication, most people were interested in there being more or much more replication studies conducted in ecology. Though obviously, as you can see, some people were happy with the state of play as it is and other people were keen on there being less replication studies in ecology. We also asked these people about what barriers there are to replication and three things came out reasonably often. I've taken some indicative quotes here as well. So academic culture being prohibitive of replication studies came out quite a lot. And a good quote of this 
is I think most scientists want to be known for original work, not doing somebody else's sciences. There's also a perceived difficulty in funding replication studies and also publishing them because of this drive for new novel research. Someone said, it's hard to publish. There are very limited resources for biodiversity ecology research anyway, suggesting that they um, can't see a place for spending the resources on, on replication studies. And then there's skepticism that replications are worthwhile, which I think is driven by a view that's more in line with the original view of replication studies where you keep everything um, the same. Uh, someone said, it's really difficult in ecology to actually replicate a study. Conditions are always changing. So if you get a different result, are you really refuting the original study? Um, I hope that I've drawn a little bit of light to this by my discussions of what's within and without of scope and how that relates to what qualifies as a replication study, but it's a definitely a gray area here. You can get some kind of inference about how reliable the original study was, but it's always going to be a little bit less clear than if you're doing an exact replication of a lab experiment. If we aren't going to replicate studies, how can we ensure that our research is reliable or that research is reliable in a general sense? And this is mostly drawn off insights that I've gained working with Fiona and the MetaMelb group. Um, the first way, um, and I think the way that we should all start with is using our judgment to work out how replicable or reliable research is, which might seem a little bit silly, um, but there's been a number of studies in the social and behavioral sciences where alongside these large scale replication projects, they also run a prediction project where people, uh, other scientists are asked to predict whether each of these studies will replicate, uh, which is to say they'll find similar results when they're repeated or not. So these invariably, these studies both include prediction markets where you bet on the outcome of a replication study, as well as a simple survey where people are just asked to rate on a scale of zero to 100, how likely a particular study is to replicate. And you can see that the accuracy of these two methods are pretty similar, um, but I would say reasonably promising. Like if we're looking at something that's close to you know, between 61 or 58 and 85% accuracy, that's a pretty good accuracy at telling how reliable research is just by reading the paper and applying your judgment. Working with Fiona on the Replicats project, we've been trying to introduce a new protocol where we get groups to discuss, uh, to read the paper and then discuss them in, in groups and then update their judgments based on uh, the input of their group members. And we found in preliminary work that the accuracy of this method in predicting replication is 77%. So that's definitely within the realm of these prediction markets and simple surveys and potentially better than some of the outcomes they achieved. Though the um, set of articles we're comparing here is quite different. But these three methods are kind of tangential to what the point I'm trying to make here is. So basically what these results say to me is that if we actually try and think about how reliable or replicable research is when we're reading it, we can tell. I mean, not all the time, but we have a fairly good idea of how reliable research is just by really carefully reading it. So I'd recommend um, putting that lens over the next time you read an article and seeing whether different things pop out than the kinds of things you'd usually be looking at. Because I've definitely found working in this project that it's a completely different mindset you bring to reviewing a paper when you're thinking about whether it's likely to be replicable and reliable. But I'm not really sure why those are not ideas that we should be drawing on every time we read an article. So I'd just recommend having a think about that next time you read anything. Another thing we can do to ensure that research is more reliable is conduct more robust research. In ecology, there's three really good ways to do this, I think. 
there's, I'm certain there's heaps more, but these are the three I want to highlight. There's multi-lab studies or distributed experiments. Um, Nutnet is among many, but one of the most prominent examples of this. And there's studies where you use the same method to research the same questions in different locations. And they help to investigate the reliability and robustness of your inferences without having to do a replication study as such. You can also conduct studies with larger temporal and spatial scales. I know I'm saying this reasonably flippantly, there's obviously reasons why we don't always conduct studies over the long term or a wide spatial scale. Um, we know that it would be preferable to do that, but it, doing larger scale studies helps reduce the likelihood that results are due to environmental stochasticity and can be really important in making research more reliable. You could also conduct studies that deliberately include variation. So this might be, um, for example, a study that includes data collected in a bunch of different ways for the same purpose. So um, you might use data collected from, you know, some previously collected data and then also collect your data in a similar way and combine both of those data sets to, to check your, to like check the reliability of your outcomes. Um, and it helps reduce the likelihood that your results are driven by any particular peculiarities of your data collection protocols. You can also check whether your results are driven by specific analytic choices. So there's two options I know of here. The first one is a multiverse analysis, which is sort of an extreme sensitivity analysis where you present the results of lots of different data pre-processing and analysis options. In an ideal world, you present all of the different or all of the plausible um, data processing and analysis options in a multiverse analysis. But um, I think that there might be some more flexibility in, in what con constitutes that. You might be able to get away with a more sensible and restricted set, depending on um, how complex the question you're investigating is. And then there is um, many analyst projects. So this is a project where lots of analysts evaluate the same question using the same data set. There are a couple of examples of these from social sciences, uh, so social and um, brain science, I think. Uh, and also we are running one ourselves at the moment in ecology and evolution. Telling you a bit about that's probably not completely in scope of this talk, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm completely in love with the project. So we're calling this uh, mini eco analyst, eco evo analyst project, and we're getting multiple people to analyze the same data set for the same questions. When we started thinking about this, we realized that the outcomes you'd get for this might be quite different depending on which data set you're, you're using and which questions you're asking. So to try and build in some robustness into our results, we looked at two different data sets with two different research questions. So we're looking at how does simple sibling competition affect blue tip growth? And to what extent does grass cover influence eucalypt recruitment, which is how many baby eucalypts grow? We want to know how differently people analyze the same questions, how much the results differ, and whether the differ, differences between these results are driven due to the quality of the analyses. There are 486 people involved, and plus the, uh, the team who is masterminding the grand plan here, which includes um, Tim, Elliot, Shinichi, Peter, Fiona, Simon, and I. We are in the process of finalizing our data pre-processing for this at the moment, which has not been a trivial task because we've had so many fantastic analyses done using a massively wide variety of techniques, which aren't that easy to directly compare with each other. Um, so we've had 91 teams of people analyze the blue tip data and 84 for the eucalypt recruitment data. 138 complete analyses of the blue tip data versus 103 of the eucalypt data and over 300 reviews of the methods used in these techniques for both data sets, which is just a phenomenal amount of work by a fantastic group of 
ecologists from all around the world. And I've been completely blown away by working with these people. Um, it's been the best project I've done. And I'm hoping that we get our results out soon because um, I'm really keen to share them with everybody. So back into the stream of this talk. If we can't ever learn how reliable ecology research is, what do we do? Well, we can improve our practices without uh, the way we learnt at Sortie, because in the end, it doesn't really matter how reliable ecology research is, except for if I'm trying to justify my existence for a grant funder or um, a job. We can still, we know that there are ways that we can improve the reliability of our practices and we could just shortcut straight to doing those. There's been some fantastic presentations and unconferences and workshops throughout Sortie that have drilled down on some of these practices that we can use. I'm sure I've missed some here, but I'd really encourage you, if you missed any of these presentations, you can follow the links and um, catch up on them or talk to any of these people here who uh, have fantastic insights and all of these different practices that we can use to make our research more reliable. Of course, I'm always excited about talking about these as well, but um, there's so many people with great expertise here at Sortie. I'd like to thank my amazing collaborators and all of the ecology meta researchers out there. It's so exciting to see so many people excited about um, improving the way ecology and related work is done. And I'll take any questions you've got. Um, thanks, Hannah. That was fantastic. Um, the questions are coming through in Q&A now, but to give people a tiny bit more time, I'm going to ask you, um, it, a, a number of the alternatives that you recommended to replacing kind of direct or close replication seem to, seem to depend on a team science approach, which is in itself a kind of revolution. Um, what do we need to do to motivate more of that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think I think it's inherently motivating. I think people are really excited about being part of large scale collaborative projects. So I think it's not so much about motivating people to do that. I think it's about making it easier, making it more accessible and making it possible for a greater diversity of people to participate in those kinds of projects rather than just creating networks of people that you might already know which is the easy but less effective way of approaching those questions. Pete Vesk um, asks, so thinking about harking and ecological studies that are exploratory modeling um, rather than confirmatory hypothesis testing work, do you have thoughts on how to frame the aims or questions in the concluding paragraph of the introduction that you would write for such studies? Harking is a really interesting one because it comes out as one that ecologists are engaging in really frequently. But unlike in other fields, we very rarely specifically identify a hypothesis. We often just frame things in the introduction in a way that implies that we knew all this stuff before we conducted a study, which makes it, I think, a little bit more of a gray area. In terms of how I would phrase something in an introduction to make it clear that I didn't, I didn't have the hypotheses beforehand. I think there are two things here. I think that despite temptation otherwise and advice otherwise, I would say that things shouldn't go into your introduction if you didn't know them before you conducted your study. Um, because I think including those things there implies a hypothesis that you didn't have. And in terms of exploratory modeling, I think that it's very fair to just display your research question in all of its glorious vagueness as you had it before you started your research. Um, and then in your methods and results, just present the range of analyses you did as you actually did them, not a restricted set, even if that means the world's largest supplementary files. 
Um, this, here's another question that actually uh, is um, a new, uh, completely new to me. So if the original study required ethics approval, um, then the replication study probably will too. Are you were aware of anyone having looked at ethical approval as a component of replication studies? I'm not. It's one of those tricky things that um, I've thought about a few times as being a potential area for some really good research. I mean, it'd be really cool if you could find everybody's um, ethics approvals and match them to what they ended up doing in their in their study. But that's a bit of a tangent. Um, I think in terms of um, ethics, I feel like I'm losing track of, of the question. Would you ask it again, Fiona? Um, unfortunately, I foolishly put it in the answer, but hang on, let me see. Um, so if the original study, so we track, I think what the question's getting at is, you know, when we do a replication, we try and do lots of things as closely as we can to the original. Um, and people often look at, you know, whether conditions were blinded or how you set this up or how the analysis was done, all these other components. Um, but one thing that we maybe don't look at is, um, is what the ethics approval process look like as part of this. I, I think, I hope I'm getting this right. Please um, tell me in the Q and A if I'm not if I've if I've butchered this question. So uh, yeah, yeah, we we yeah. I don't personally know of any studies that have looked at the replicability aspects of the ethics application process. Do you no, I think it'd be pretty tricky. I think there's really substantial differences even between institutions and how they do their ethics approvals, even within mm. the same country. But when you look between countries, the, um, the approval processes are very different and the cutoffs are very different, which might make it actually quite hard to replicate some studies in, well, even in a modern day context or in a different country where the protocols might be more strict. And I think I think that's quite interesting, actually, particularly if we think about some some push at the moment to um, for ethics committees to be the the place that's responsible for helping mitigate questionable research practices, checking on the statistical power of studies, so including those kinds of methodology things as ethical issues. And if we don't, if we're not sort of sufficiently aware of differences in that process, then that could have implications for replicability down the track. Yeah, oh, definitely. new questions. Uh, let me, okay, here's a question from Dom. What are your thoughts on statements of generalization or generalizability in papers? Some journals in psychology have started requiring, I think this is about constraints of generality. Um, yeah. Is there a value in ecology and evolution journals following this lead? Yeah, so this is, a, I really love the idea of constraints on generality statements and made an attempt at an article on this a little while ago that turned out to be much more difficult than I'd thought, where I went through and tried to, well, with a, a bunch of really fantastic helpers, um, tried to categorise um, the constraints of generality as specified in existing ecological studies. And people are doing it um, very differently, very differently to each other at the moment. And some people are doing a really stellar job of providing constraints. Some people go too far, I think. And a lot of people um, grossly overextend their study, saying things like this will apply to all vertebrates or um, things like that. And I think that there'd be it'd be a really great advance if journals made this more, <laughs> journals made this more possible or more required because at the moment, theoretically being, being more modest in your constraints and generality is a disadvantage. If you want to get your journal, your article published at a high impact journal, they want to see things with global significance, not things where you've been very careful about exactly how far you expect that study to extend. Fortunately, it looks like Pete Vest just volunteered to revive that constraints on generality study. So that's good news, isn't it? 
Yeah, I feel like that was more of an advice rather than a volunteer. <laughs> um, if we, here's a question from Dave Duncan. If we accept that unreplicated studies should be treated as provisional understandings, do you think this should be reflected in the way that we tend to summarise what's known in the early part of your of an article's introduction? Yes, definitely. Um, though I think that it's more of a, I would say that it's more indicative of a change that we should make in the way we view how we read the literature. Um, yes, it should be represented in people's introductions, but I think the reason it's tough to get things that are replications or less novel research published is because when we read research, by default, we assume that it's true. Um, and I think that it's really hard to get away from that to a more nuanced view of, you know, this is evidence that suggests that there might be a relationship here. Even if something has been replicated, I think that it's um, worth being a bit more nuanced in how we think about, you know, the truth or the, you know, how much weight to give each of these studies. Is that a, f a failure of science of training, training in science and critical evaluation in the literature? Why do why do people do that? I think Read the fact that we're taught all through school and undergraduate a list of scientific facts that we then have to regurgitate in multiple choice questions is not helping. Um, but I think it's also a um, a tendency of a human tendency to try and simplify the world into known and unknown things. Um, let me read you this question from Colin Strine. Uh, do you have plans to extend that many analyst project or follow up with it in any way? I think that folks who didn't get involved in the current project would probably be keen to get involved in a new project, including Colin. This is a real volunteering <laughs> proposition. It's fantastic. I think um, I'm not certain that I'll be able to convince my other collaborators to go again on this. It's been a completely wonderful experience, but way more difficult than I and I think they had um, anticipated. The, um, the tricky thing, which is also the most fantastic thing, is that people have analysed things in such a massive variety of ways that the outputs from their models are so different that they're almost impossible to compare. <laughs> um, and it's been really tricky working out ways to do that, that is um, reasonable and representative and nuanced. I would love to do another project like this, but perhaps as the analyst with somebody else driving it. Um, I, I, someone would have to fact check what I'm about to say, but I think this is the biggest many analyst project that's run across any discipline? I think we probably have more than anybody else, yeah. I think we also took- Not bad for the first one in the field, sorry. Yeah, I think we also took it a little bit further because the previous ones have been in um, social and neurological science and they were more careful to specify a really specific hypothesis, which we decided wasn't as um, representative of how people approach research in ecology. So we frame things as reasonably vague questions, which are the kinds of questions you might have when you're actually going into an ecological study, which I think has caused more variation than you might see in, in one of those other studies. I have been fact checked by Daniel who says, you know, particle physics has more probably. I'm, that's fair. I don't look in particle yeah. physics very much, so perhaps <laughs> I should. Um, here's another question from Dom about the registered report, about the many analysts project. So the many analyst study was a registered report. How yes. closely were you able to follow the registered part of the method? Uh, not nearly as closely as we'd hoped is the uh, short answer of that. We got, we really, really thought it through very carefully before we started. And then um, once we collected people's data, it was clear that they'd done things um, more differently than we'd expected. So we came in with the assumption that everybody would do one analysis um, that would answer that question. But in reality, 
a lot of teams did a whole lot of different analyses um, to answer the same question in a sort of slightly multiverse, slightly sensitivity analysis approach. And the way we were collecting and analyzing our data originally didn't fit with that. So we had to change course mid project. Um, we did submit a revision to the registered report, but that was not, um, they chose not to review that and they've just, we're, we're just gonna have to include that in our write-up as a statement of difference and we'll see how that goes. But it was, um, it's been really good, the register report process, but it was tricky when we didn't know exactly how it was gonna pan out. Um, more questions about many analysts. Are you going to share your experience and recommend some guidelines for how to perform these kinds of many analyst projects so that other teams could use them. It would be amazing to see more of these initiatives, but it sounds difficult. Was it difficult, Hannah? I would say it was difficult. I would say that in terms of things that were difficult, um, uh, Elliot Gould has been absolutely invaluable in that project. They have been the tech lead um, and our GitHub um, maestro trying to reproducibly join together people's various responses and help people through the process of providing their data in a way that we can compare. And that's been, I think, the hardest for Elliot, but also it's just been very tricky. I think it would be fantastic after we've done to write up uh, insights on how on how you can streamline the process. Um, I imagine there are people in the team, including Elliot, uh, who you mentioned, who've been very careful about documenting the processes as you've gone through them. It is absolutely re uh, reproducible workflow. Yeah. It's not in a container yet, but we're not finished, so. <laughs> yeah, um, here's, uh, here's what might be close to the final question. We might have time for one more after this if people are quick. And Matt Jones ask, asks, how might we achieve the changes you've argued are needed given the real world incentive structures in academia to publish in particular venues with over general conclusions? So uh, are an individual's good intentions enough? I think that an individual's good intentions are an important starting point. I think without people who are excited about doing things better, nothing can change. But I think it's very difficult until the incentives also change because although some of the practices you can conduct without incurring substantial personal career cost, other ones will slow down your publication rate and make you publish fewer, more reliable, better studies which is what I think we should be wanting in ecology and science in general, but perhaps doesn't always show up well on hiring committees and, and um, funding applications. I think, yeah, institutional change I think is required, but without people who are excited about making those changes, it can't happen. It's a very diplomatic answer. Um, do we have any final questions, Tim? Do you want the chance for a question or is it time to move? Should we move across? Yeah, I, I actually was going to ask a question, but I well, let me ask this this question really quickly and then I'll dig around for the I'll put the the uh, the link to the to the mixer in the chat. Um, the question I wanted to ask Hannah was just getting back to the just to all the to all the replication stuff. Um, this is just a perennially uh, asked question, but I think it's worth talking about. How how do you see prioritization happening, or you know, selecting studies to to replicate? How how should that process go? I think it's an it's an interesting question. It depends on your objectives with your replication. I think that you can make an argument that we should start by replicating the most highly cited papers if we wanna make an impact to, to say something about um, how poor those metrics are at determining research quality. If we're interested in something that's more about how 
um, how much impact research has in real life. It'd be more sensible to look at research that has had real practical implications and try and replicate those things. Things that are used in management practices would be a good target um, if we wanted to make uh, a to make conclusions on that scale. If we're talking about just an individual replicating a study though, people should be doing it in things that are important for their own research. The stuff that they rely on to as foundations. Yeah, that's not a very good answer, but basically depending on your context, <laughs> it's different. True ecologists answer to anything. All right. Any any final quick questions in the in the roughly minute and a half that we have left? Let's, any let's just cruise over to the to the other. We always run out of time in the uh, in the um, in the mixer, so we might as well just go over there now. All right, let me post that link again, and um, and let's thank before we leave. Let's thank Hannah for her talk and contributions to questions. And see, see you all in in the next bit.